Stop me if you've heard this before. November was another slow month for sales in Ottawa. And the federal government is stepping up to the plate to help with housing. But are they really? The holidays are right around the corner and we are about to jingle your bells with this year's December Ottawa real estate market update. So let's get right into it. Andrew, what's your favorite Christmas song? Anything from uh, Michael Bublé. Michael Bublé. Oh, I thought you were going to say something by Drake. <laughs> <laughs> no? Does Drake do Christmas music? I don't think so. Not that you're aware of? No. Okay. Uh, so before we get to the stats, we just want to thank our sponsor for this month's update. This month's market update is brought to you by Burger King. Burger King. Just because your dog wouldn't eat it doesn't mean you can't. That was very nice. Uh, okay. Well, you know what? Let's, let's do that one again. Burger King. Our burgers are like breath mints for dumpsters. All right. Yeah. Much better. Much better. All right. Andrew, you know, I used to work at Burger King. No, I never yeah, did. This is like one of my first jobs. I was 16 years old. It was the second worst job I've ever had. I won't say the first here, but maybe there'll be one of our sponsors at one point. Anyways, don't recommend working there or eating there, but thank you Burger King for the imaginary sponsorship nonetheless. All right, let's dive in. Uh, in case you're unfamiliar with our format here, uh, we don't just screw around. We actually provide information as well. So I'm going to run you through the November stats for both freehold and condo sales in Ottawa. And then in the second half of the video, we'll tackle some bigger picture housing market stuff. So let's kick this off with the freehold stats for the month. Andrew, let's deck the halls with stats of Holly Lee. Let's just put the stats up on the screen. Ba la 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 la, la 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 la. All right. So November was a lot like October when it comes to the freehold market in Ottawa. The one real change was that the average selling price broke out of the range it had been in for the last few months. Now we'll talk more about that in a moment. But first, let's talk about volume. We sold 628 freehold homes in Ottawa in November. That's about 5% lower than November of 2022, when the market was also extremely slow. And it's well below what we'd expect in a typical November, where in a good year, we might expect 900 to 1200 sales. And then in a not so good year, we'd still expect to be in that 700 to 800 range. Sales volume this November, just like last month, was the lowest we've seen in the month of November since 2008, which I will remind you was in the midst of the US housing market crash. Now, we spoke about this in last month's video, but the crash in the US caused a lot of fear up north, Canada. And even though we didn't see a US style crash here, it did put a pretty major damper on our housing market for a while there. In spite of the low sales volume, inventory, Andrew, you know the drill, inventory is? Measure of supply and demand. That's right. Inventory, which is a measure of supply and demand, basically stayed flat in November. We did technically go from 4.5 months of inventory in October to 4.6 months of inventory in November. So not perfectly flat, but for all intents and purposes, flat. Now, what that really means is that for the month, supply entered the market at about the same pace as demand. Andrew, you see that visual? Yeah. <laughs> it's not paying attention to the care. <laughs> All right. So 4.6 months of inventory puts us in the lower portion of the range for a balanced market, which is between four and six months total inventory. As always, usual disclaimer here, it's an oversimplification to take the average inventory level across the entire city. And then based only on that, say that we're in this type of market or that type of market. So yeah. one last thought about freehold inventory levels. Inventory had been climbing steadily since the month of May. So this is actually the first time in a while that we've seen inventory levels kind of settle, but that's not a huge surprise given the time of year. November is a month where traditionally you're not going to see a ton of new listings coming to market. Most folks at this point prefer to wait until next year to list their properties if that's an option for them. It would also not surprise me one bit to see inventory stay flat or even come down by the end of this month, December. And that's because in addition to the low number of new listings that typically come to market at this time of year, we're also getting to that point in the calendar where a lot of sellers who've been on the market for a while and who haven't sold yet, start taking their properties off the market, right? They figure they'll try again next year. And as a result, supply gets further reduced. Now time will tell whether I'm right with that prediction or not. I guess you'll just have to tune into the January market update to find out. All right, now let's talk price. The average selling price for a freehold home in November 
was about $688,000. That's about a 3% drop from last month. And it's the first time since January of this year where we failed to break 700K. Now, if you've been watching these updates every month, first of all, thank you. And second of all, you know that the average selling price for freehold homes has landed in that 710K to 725K range for the past few months. So now that we've broken through that, you know, that that 710K resistance level on the downside, does it mean that values are dropping? Yes and no. Maybe, maybe not, right? Keep in mind that yes, property values and the average monthly selling price are, are certainly linked. Not gonna deny that, but they're not one in the same. When the monthly average goes up or down, it doesn't necessarily mean that the value of your home went up or down by that same amount. We've done videos on this in the past. I encourage you to look them up if you'd like a more in-depth explanation of how it all works. But yes, low sales volume and you know, rising inventory levels, now balanced market inventory levels will apply some downward pressure pressure on prices for sure, but there are also likely some temporary seasonal factors at play here. First off, November, December, and January are almost always the slowest and the worst months of the year for real estate, especially in cities like Ottawa, where the weather gets kind of miserable. Second, and look, I hate to use this term, but a lot of the homes that you find on the market at this time of year are the, the leftovers from the spring, summer, and fall markets. So just about all of the tens out of tens, the nines, and even the eights have sold by now. And, and those are the properties that are usually gonna get top dollar and they're gonna help bring up the monthly averages. They also, uh, look, all things being equal, no one really wants to list their home in November or December. And, and so the people who are listing their homes at this time of year, they're typically, not always, but typically very motivated sellers, right? And then that same thing also usually applies to the people who did list earlier in the year, but who are still on the market as we head into the holiday season. So in a nutshell, this is the time of year where we see a lot of sellers shift their priorities from like squeezing every single penny out of the sale to just getting it sold before the holidays so they don't have to worry about it. And a lot of savvy buyers know this. And so this is the time of year where they start going out and shopping for deals. I, I could tell you for a fact that the offers that come in on listings at this time of year are usually a fair bit more aggressive than the ones you'd see in say April. So those are some of the seasonal dynamics, big words. Those are some of the seasonal dynamics that can contribute to a downward shift in average selling price. Again, not the same as values at this time of year. And so on that note, uh, if you are thinking of buying a home and you are looking to get a really, really good deal, this is often the best time of year to go shopping. Just keep in mind though, that you're typically going to get a great deal or a great home. Very rarely do you get both. So, you know, the question I often ask my, like, you know, my, my deal shopper buyers is, would you rather pay an okay price for a great home or get a great price on an okay home? Quickly, before we wrap up Freehold here, uh, the average number of days to sell last month was 39. That's up from 32 in October. No big surprise there. The same seasonal factors that we just discussed play a big role in, in that metric as well. And finally, homes on average sold for 97.4% of their list price in November. That is right in line with what you'd expect in a balanced market here, where properties will typically sell for around 97% of their list price, give or take. All right, so that'll do it for Freehold. Uh, now let's quickly run through the condo stats before we yeah, get to the news. All right, so Andrew, let's drum up the November condo stats now. Power up a pum pum. All right, so <laughs> no real change to report in the condo market since last month. I am repeating myself here, but for the last few months, condos have more or less followed the same general trends as the freehold market. Only condos have been a little more resilient. Uh, they've continued to sell a little bit better than freehold. November was more of the same. We sold 199 condos in Ottawa in November. That's about 6% more than we sold in November of 2022 the year that comes before 2023. Don't know if I'll ever get tired of making that same lame joke. Andrew, you think I'm funny, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. why'd you say that like you're scared? <laughs> All right, so uh, the 6% more sales than last year might sound significant, but we're literally only talking about 11 extra sales here. This November's total of 199 sales is still a fair bit lower than what we've come to expect in the month of November. You'd have to go back to about 2015 to find the last time that condo sales were at these levels, excluding last year. And just for some added context, over the last few years, typical November total for condo sales would have us fall anywhere between like the high 200s and the low 400s. The average sale price of a condo in November was 423K. That's down from about 441K in October. However, condo prices have really just bounced around within that 410K to 450K range for the entire year. And 423K is right in that very range. Hashtag math. All right, so we closed November out with 3.6 months of condo inventory. That's up from 3.3 months of inventory that we had at the end of October, the month that comes before November. Still funny to me. So condo inventory is creeping up, but we've yet to officially hit that, that balanced market threshold. Same disclaimer. All right, last but not least, uh, condos on average took 35 days to sell in November, and those that did sell ended up going for a 97.6% of their list price on average. So once again, condo market is still a little stronger than the freehold market right now. And, and that is very likely due to the fact that condos remain a more affordable option, or, or maybe I should say a less unaffordable option compared to freehold. All right, so that'll do it for this month's stats. Now let's dive into the second part of the video where we take a, a bigger picture look at some of the things that are happening in the housing market. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you, there's a lot that is happening right now in real estate, not sales, unfortunately, but a lot nonetheless. And uh, so it's kind of hard to decide what to talk about this month without, you know, just kind of like jumping all over the place, which is pretty much what I do anyways. So, but I, I landed on a couple things that I think tie together nicely, both of them having to do with mortgages and interest rates. There's been a ton of talk and a ton of press lately around the fact that a lot of these super low interest rate COVID mortgages are going to be up for renewal in the not so distant future. In fact, the bulk of these low rate mortgages are set to renew throughout 2025 and 2026, where interest rates are almost certainly, and I, and I don't really think you need the almost here, going to be higher than they were in 2020 and 2021 when these mortgages were first entered into. Now, just how much higher? That's anyone's guess. There are a lot of different predictions on the topic. We're gonna to leave that alone. And so, the line of thinking that we're seeing lately in the media and in you know, like various places online is that these renewals, when they come up, are going to cause a lot of borrowers to experience what we're calling mortgage shock. And in some cases, these borrowers may straight up not be able to afford their new higher mortgage payments, which could ultimately force them to have to sell their homes. Some folks uh, are even going as far as to predict that the, this, this mortgage shock phenomenon is gonna end up causing a, a full-blown housing market crash. Now, I'm on the record in saying that I do not believe that we're in a housing bubble in Ottawa, nor do I think we're going to experience any sort of major housing crash here. And, and when I say major crash, I'm not talking about cherry picking points on a graph to, to paint a picture. I am referring to a significant drop in property values across the board that is sustained over multiple years time. Okay, so just so we're clear. So again, I can't speak for every single Canadian city, but I, I just don't see that happening here in Ottawa for a number of reasons, which I've discussed in previous videos. Feel free to check them out and which I'm sure we'll discuss again in future videos as well. So we're not gonna go too far down that particular rabbit hole this month. But, but all this talk of mortgage shock and you know people being forced out of their homes hasn't just caught my attention. It's also seemingly caught the attention of Canada's governing party, the Liberals. So much so in fact, that the Liberals decided they, they had to get proactive and they had to do something about this looming threat. Sort of, sort of. You see, in their annual fall economic statement, Andrew, is it economic or economic? How do you say it? Economic. Econom see, I say economic. I think maybe it's a French thing. I'm not sure. Anyways, let us know. Do you pronounce it economic or economic? Let us know in the comments. Learn me something. All right, so anyways, in their fall statement, the Liberals introduced a new Canadian mortgage charter, right? Canadian mortgage charter, which is a set of six guidelines that are aimed specifically at helping vulnerable borrowers, try to say that three times fast, stay in their homes. Now, when announcing the Canadian mortgage charter, 
Christia Freeland, who is Canada's Minister of Finance, gave the following quote. So she said, I really recognize that with interest rates having gone up very quickly, there are many, many Canadians who are concerned about their mortgages going up. They are concerned about being able to afford to stay in their own homes. What we're saying today is we understand that this is a challenging situation and we are here to help. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Look, I am 100% nonpartisan, all right? I have no political allegiances, so this is not meant to be a political statement of any kind. It's not an endorsement, but, but I have to say, I can't help but feel like that quote from Minister Freeland maybe, maybe lacks a teensy, teensy bit of self-awareness. It's kind of like getting run over by an ambulance while you're crossing the street and then having the driver step out and say, don't worry, don't worry, I'm here to help. <laughs> like, oh, thank God you were here. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. All right, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go through the six guidelines that were included in this Canadian mortgage charter. We're gonna provide some commentary because that's what we do. Again, these are measures that are meant to provide relief to vulnerable borrowers. So guideline number one is to allow for temporary extensions on the amortization period for mortgage holders. So look, there's really nothing new about this. Uh, banks have always had the freedom to do this when the situation calls for it. Um, it's also really not all that different from reamortization or even refinancing of an existing mortgage. All right, but hey, Moving on, guideline number two is to waive fees and costs that would have otherwise been charged for mortgage relief measures. Okay. I mean, again, banks already have the ability and have had the ability to do this at their discretion for a very long time. They're also generally willing to waive a lot of these fees if you just negotiate a little, because at the end of the day, they wanna keep your business. All right, now, to be fair, I suppose we are now encouraging these banks to be a little bit more proactive in waiving their fees. So like, I'll, I'll say there is some good in that. Guideline number three is that people with an insured mortgage are exempt from having to requalify under the stress test when they renew their mortgage. Not new, not at all. This has literally been in place since the stress test was introduced in 2017. So long as you keep the same mortgage insurer, you don't have to requalify when you renew your mortgage. Moving on, guideline number four requires banks to reach out to homeowners four to six months in advance of their mortgage renewal to inform them of their options. Like, really? So basically the Canadian Mortgage Charter is recommending that businesses run their business like a business. Got it. Pretty sure every bank on the planet already does this, but cool, thanks for the tip, I guess. Guideline number five is to allow borrowers to make lump sum payments in order to avoid negative amortization or to sell their principal residence without incurring prepayment penalties. Okay, so credit where credit is due, uh, this one could actually add some real value. Now, the first part about allowing borrowers to make lump sum payments is something that's really already in place just about everywhere. The, the, the very, very, very large majority of mortgage products out there have some form of lump sum or prepayment provision built right into them. So that's not new or innovative in the least. However, the second part about waiving penalties on the sale of a primary residence would be new. This would mean that, for example, if you had to sell your home in, in say year two of a five year fixed mortgage term, you would no longer have to pay a hefty penalty for, for breaking your mortgage the way you would today. All right, so th this would actually be great. Now, before you get too excited though, keep in mind these guidelines are only meant to apply to vulnerable borrowers. It's not for everyone. Right, also, on a related note, the best way to recoup that mortgage penalty when selling your home is to just hire a really, really good realtor who'll get you top dollar. So the sixth and final guideline in the Canadian Mortgage Charter is to waive interest on interest when mortgage relief measures result in payments that fail to cover interest payments on a loan. So basically what they're saying to banks here is like if someone falls behind on their payments, don't charge them interest on interest. Seems like common sense. I think this is really mostly in reference to something that happened when COVID first hit in, in 2020 here. You know, obviously we had all these lockdowns and there's a lot of people who couldn't work and, and you know, everything was just kind of a big disaster. And so a lot of the big banks at the time announced 
that they were gonna to come to the rescue and they were gonna allow their customers to defer their mortgage payments for up to as much as six months, right? If you remember, the catch, however, for the people who chose to defer their payments at the time was that those entire payments, principal and interest, were tacked onto their mortgage balance, right? So these people ended up in a situation where they were paying interest on interest. So the banks that did this were, were blasted in the media, There's many articles, this is one of them, and I, and I think we'd all agree rightfully so, that was a pretty slimy move of them. However, I don't think that banks charging interest on interest is like a big problem right now. I don't think it's something that really happens all that much, if at all, but I suppose it is good to remind the banks that they shouldn't do it to vulnerable borrowers. In fact, they probably just shouldn't do it to anyone for that matter. All right, so that is your Canadian mortgage charter, ladies and gentlemen. Now, as, as you could probably tell by my tone and reading through the, the six guidelines, I'm not totally convinced that this charter is going to impact much change, if any, unfortunately, and I, and I mean that sincerely. To me, this is really just a repackaging of existing policies and measures uh, that were already in place in an effort to create a, a positive headline. And the fact that there's really nothing that's all that new or innovative in the Canadian mortgage charter isn't even the biggest issue that I have with it. The two biggest problems I see with the charter are that one, this is meant to provide relief to vulnerable, vulnerable borrowers. God, that's hard to say. Vulnerable borrowers, okay? Only we don't actually define what constitutes a vulnerable borrower, all right? So it sounds like they're basically gonna leave it up to the banks to decide who's vulnerable and who's not, right? What could go wrong with that? And two, it's been made very clear that these guidelines are just that. They are guidelines. They are not laws. They're not going to be made into laws. They're not even rules. They are just guidelines. Andrew, you know what another word for guideline is? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Suggestions, recommendations, pretty pleases, right? So this charter, as good as the intentions behind it may be, really just has has no teeth. Now, beyond this, this, you know, Canadian mortgage charter that will, I think, unfortunately, probably just be forgotten in a few months, there has been a little bit of actual positive news recently on the mortgage front. And that news is that we have started to see fixed interest rates quietly tick down in recent weeks. Now, you may not have heard about this, and the reason for that is because fixed rates don't get the same kind of attention that variable rates do. All right, you see, when the Bank of Canada does their, their dog and pony show eight or so times a year, you know, when they hold this big press conference and they announce that they're raising interest rates or they're lowering interest rates or they're just leaving interest rates right where they are, right? and then the media runs with it and every realtor on the planet posts about it on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook or whatever, right? The only mortgages that are impacted by those announcements are variable rate mortgages. The announcements have nothing to do with fixed rate mortgages. And that's because fixed rate mortgages are based on the bond market. Andrew, do you know how the bond market works? No, it's James Bond. <laughs> no, it's not James Bond. I, I also don't know how the bond market works. I don't think anyone <laughs> really knows how the bond market works, to be honest. And that is probably uh, at least a part of the reason why fixed interest rates just don't get the same kind of media attention that variable rates do. However, bond yields not James Bond yields, Andrew, just bond yields, have started to come down in recent weeks. And uh, when that happens, fixed rate mortgages tend to follow. Now, the drop in fixed rates hasn't been like huge, right? We're, we've basically gone from the, the low sixes to the kind of mid to high fives for a lot of the most popular mortgage products. But if the trend continues, I absolutely expect that it's going to have an impact on the housing market come early 2024. Keep in mind that roughly three out of every four mortgages in Ottawa are fixed rate mortgages, all right? So fixed rates do ultimately tend to play a bigger role in what happens with housing prices. But I think there can be a bit of a lag between those two factors because once again, the media doesn't scream from the mountaintops every time fixed rates go up or down or, or, or anything like that. So keep that in mind if you're thinking of getting into the housing market in 2024. What we've seen over the last few years is that when things start to go, they go, right, when it comes to housing. So uh, this may be good news for you, this may be bad news for you, but I, ultimately I think we might be in for another complicated spring in 2024. And you know, it really does feel super complicated sometimes, doesn't it? Like in all seriousness, we're in the middle of this insane, insane housing affordability crisis. We're, we're, lowering, we're lowering rates, we're raising rates. Neither seems to help, 
uh, were creating these, these convoluted Canadian mortgage charters, were, were coming up with new taxes for vacant properties and new taxes for luxury properties and we're, we're banning foreign buyers from owning real estate even though we're welcoming hundreds of thousands if not millions of newcomers to Canada every year. We're making short-term rentals illegal even though there's a real need for them in, in some areas and, and you know some populations have a real need for them. We've got people having to share these like these tiny basement apartments or even worse they're living in tents right? Like, I mean like golly like does it it just never seems to end, does it, right? And so, I mean, God, it's, it's hot in here. Andrew, you feeling it's hot in here? Yeah, it's a, yeah. It's a little warm. Uh, anyways, so yeah, it just, anyways, it never seems to end. So, you know, I wish, I just wish there was like a simple, a simple solution to all of this. I wish there was a way to like, to just, you know, like to just fix, just fix housing affordability. I wish there was a way. If only there was a way to just kind of fix housing affordability and like, I, I feel like there is. I feel like there is. I, I feel like there is. I just, just not sure what it is. But there's got to be. There's got to be a simple solution. Anyways, I'm, I'm sure it'll come to me. I'm sure it'll come to me at some point. Anyways, uh, that's a wrap everyone. <laughs> the next market update we do is gonna be in 2024. As always, if you have any real estate questions or if you'd like to have a confidential chat about your situation, your real estate goals, I am always, always happy to help. You can access my calendar directly and book a call with me at a time that works for you by using the Calendly link in this video's description. Now, one last note before we go, I just wanna say a very sincere thank you to everybody who watches these videos. It really means a lot to us uh, and, and obviously a very special, huge thank you to uh, those of you who continue to use my services and refer me to their friends and family. It really, truly means the world to me. I, I can't thank you enough. So I'm wishing all of you a very happy holiday season. Whatever it is you celebrate, please do it safely. And I'm looking forward to seeing all of you right back here in 2024.